everybody, welcome to 2ZQ Hot Takes, where we discuss issues both big and small. I am your host, the very handsome Tim Kirk, and today I'll be talking about being out at work for over 30 years. Bush 41 was president when I came out at work. Not exactly the warm and fuzzies. I'll admit I was late to find my wherewithal and bravery. But as I always say, you are who you are in your own time. Unless you intentionally hurt others, then all bets are off. But even then, sometimes those are actually desperate cries for help. Let's face it, we're all just human. From the Human Rights Campaign, coming out at work can seem like a challenge, but it may also relieve the daily stress of hiding who you are. No kidding. In 2020, the Supreme Court of the United States issued a decision in Bostock versus Clayton County that makes it clear that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity is prohibited under the Federal Employment Non-Discrimination Law known as Title VII. Nevertheless, you may still wish to create a plan to ensure a successful coming out. Here are some things to think about if you are considering coming out at work. Questions to ask. Does your employer have a written non-discrimination policy? Does it specifically cover sexual orientation and or gender identity expression? Does insurance cover domestic partner benefits? Does health coverage cover transitioning costs? Is there a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer employee resource group at your workplace? What's the overall climate in your workplace? Do people tend to make derogatory comments or jokes? Are any of your coworkers openly LGBTQ? What are your work relationships like? Do people discuss their personal lives? Are they asking questions about yours? Is the atmosphere friendly or guarded? Does your state or locality have a non-discrimination law including sexual orientation and gender identity expression? Is your company ranked on the Human Rights Campaign Corporate Equality Index? If so, what rating has it earned? Moving forward, Once you've assessed your workplace atmosphere, here are some practical steps to take. Identify someone who is LGBTQ or LGBTQ supportive and talk to them first. Take a breath. People will often take their cues from you on how to talk and feel about LGBTQ issues. The more casual you are, the more likely they are to follow your lead. Make a plan. Talk about LGBTQ-related news stories, movies, TV shows, or other topics as a way to signal your views or start the conversation. Bring a partner or date to company functions or have them meet you at work one day. They suggest put an HRC sticker and or a picture of your partner on your desk. The benefits of being open at work eliminates the need to hide or mislead, makes deeper friendships possible, breaks down barriers to understanding, builds trusting working relationships, lets us bring our whole selves to work, 
Being open can make you more productive and can even benefit your career because peers will see you in a new, perhaps even courageous light. Well, I can also say the stress of hiding who you are is eliminated and that takes a giant weight off your shoulders. From the Harvard Business Review, seven myths about coming out at work. And I am going to just focus on one area of these seven myths because the one I have had the most difficulty with, with heteronormative people, is the idea that they are somehow annoyed that I have outed myself in the workplace over and over. It is very important to out yourself over and over. Not like I'm seeking a cheap punchline. No, not at all. Never. By Raymond Trow, Jane O'Leary, and Kathy Brown. Myth number one. Coming out at work is not a big deal. After all, it's the 21st century. Though the LGBTIQ community has seen big wins in the past few years, same-sex marriage is now legal in 26 countries and around 20 have passed some kind of legislation recognizing transgender rights. Coming out is still dangerous in many areas of the world and can be deadly for trans and gender diverse people. Even in countries that are economically developed and progressive, like Australia, homosexuality has only been decriminalized since 1997, and marriage equality was just legalized in December of last year. The LGBTIQ plus rights movement is still very much in progress, and this factors into some workplace cultures and how comfortable people may feel coming out. Myth number two, coming out is similar for all LGBTIQ plus people. Well, I mean, that's kind of obvious that it's not. Myth number three, LGBTIQ workers have complete control over whether they do or do not come out at work. I will not take exception to this, but uh, I have my own experience I'll talk about later. In fact, research shows that transgender people going through the transition process often have to come out to coworkers, causing great anxiety and distress. For some transgender people, living authentically means keeping their gender history private, particularly if they affirmed their gender identity when they were very young. For others who transition later in life, as one participant told us, we are out merely by existing. Myth number four, coming out has nothing to do with work. Our research reveals that people who are able to come out at work are happier altogether. No kidding, again. Myth number five, coming out at work happens just once. Coming out is actually a repetitive process. It occurs not just once, but on multiple occasions. For instance, as an example, a bisexual woman may come out to her immediate manager when she is first starting a job, but also later when she meets new coworkers, other managers, or clients. Among our respondents who indicated that they openly talk about their LGBTIQ plus identity at work, only 17% of them openly talk about their identity to clients. Some are concerned that being out may jeopardize client relationships and negatively impact the company as a whole. One respondent reported, during the marriage equality vote, my organization had a big client. We are talking about a multi-million dollar client who said, if you publicly support marriage equality, you will lose our business. Other respondents indicated that being out at work meant risking their lives. With every new client, I'm scared that it might be my last time walking the earth as I enter their house. This is the one I am stuck to. 
once you cross that threshold, as scary as it can be, there is really no going back. I've had to come out over and over and over again. And it's because when you're around heteronormative people, it's a nice, pleasant thing to come out and everybody agrees in principle how cool it is. But when you do it over and over again, they somehow become annoyed. But you have to let people know that you're gay. You have to. Myth number six, there is only one way to come out or not come out. And that's just absurd on the face of it. Myth number seven, people are scared to come out because of career risks. Coming out is a constant cost-benefit analysis and requires weighing different risks. A lack of support from coworkers and supervisors and past experiences of discrimination <laughs> often prevent LGB workers from coming out. But our research also shows that respondents are more concerned about social exclusion than career penalty. While about 19% of respondents who are not out at work worry their careers would be ruined if they were, 70% are concerned coming out would make their colleagues uncomfortable around them. Well, thanks to those resources. It's cruel to out people and upend the lives of others struggling. I was personally outed on a couple of occasions way back when and I felt a terrible sense of humiliation and betrayal from those who did it to me. I could never trust them again, that's for sure. They had no problem whatsoever in making my life difficult. The closeted folks are struggling, and let's be kind. Still, most gay people are not out, not by a long shot. And of course, the strikingly painful thing is when you do come out and meet other gay people who discriminate within the community the exact same way they were discriminated against when they had yet to identify. What can you do? You can't realistically expect everyone to be as sincere and straightforward as you think you are. Just because you are out doesn't mean you are honest or wear your heart on your sleeve. You just let other gay people know that you were there and quite often available. It depends on who you are inside, not merely your desires. When I was struggling with my identity, I went to the most well-known facility or resource or institution available in New York City twice and was met with dubious skepticism, suspicion, outright hostility, and rejection. Twice! No warm and fuzzies. After I got a job in an office where I thought I could apply myself to do some good, rather than be worn down as a result of the grind of the jobs I formerly held, I attempted to volunteer myself to a hotline or assist others who sought help with their own issues. And again, I was met with dubious skepticism, suspicion, hostility, and rejection. I learned or was informed that the orgs required a high level of discretion. That's a good line. <laughs> and were often targeted by posers with ulterior motives, but my feelings were hurt because I was naive and had good intentions. And I thought it was because the places were all full of overeducated, underpaid, elitist cliques. Nah. <laughs> but no warm and fuzzies. I worked in a school with real menches, whose creative and artistic contributions to culture are recognizable every day, especially in the field of audio arts, in particular music, that we all hear all the time. And they contributed timeless licks, riffs, and snatches we have collectively embraced just like the output of the legendary Wrecking Crew. And they produced the superstars we all know as legends and are well-known industry veterans. I respect and admire them greatly and savor the long-lasting friendships I have made with those who were and are just the greatest bunch of people. The definition of cool. 
I also tried to use my role at the school I was working at, especially because I was tasked with appearing at college fairs and shows to offer the opportunities to graduating students as an alternative to a college education they could not afford or just take a manual dead-end job. The school I worked for was the largest proprietary school in the country at the time. And most colleges accepted diplomas from that fully accredited trade school as 30 college credits towards a BA. It was a very good option for very many people who took it seriously and had the choice of broadcast announcing, television arts or video arts, a world-class school of photography, audio arts, and graphic arts, which at the time was training learners in the then revolutionary skills of desktop publishing and the digital version of graphic arts and design. Many people who graduated from the school did indeed go on to successful careers, and I am proud of the fact that many graduates who got careers thanked me for offering them to take the chance instead of just slaving away at a dead-end job. So, while I was so proud of myself for fostering others into good paths, I was also interested in seeking out a very fledgling, at the time, educational institution that operated above an auto body shop up a flight of rickety stairs on West Street in the West Village. They were deeply involved in connecting to at-risk gay youth and did what they could do with what appeared to be the limited resources they had to connect with as many of the at-risk spectrum of LGBT youth at the time and to get them to complete their high school education and or get a GED, among the other things they were doing. Unfortunately, I was not met with the receptive disposition I was hoping for. My bad. I was naive. No warm and fuzzies. While I was working for that school, I got the best advice I ever got in my life, and it was an unsolicited double negative. I had expressed my frustration, and my boss, who was gay and a few years older and more mature than I, said, Tim, don't believe in anyone who doesn't believe in you. It clicked with me. I took it to heart. I'm telling you, folks, don't believe in anyone who doesn't believe in you. Unfortunately, the school closed in 1993 when it attempted to merge with a college but was rebuffed by the Department of Education in D.C. for a number of reasons. Anyway, I moved on. I got other jobs. I have a wide range of anecdotal experiences. Among them, I became the office confessor. I was the gay. I saw people who were previously comfortable with my existence, albeit ignorant of my sexual identity, wince and make faces at me once they knew I was gay. People actually moved away from me in elevators to keep their distance. People approached me as if I was an oddity at a circus sideshow. They clustered together, looked over at me and snickered, then made a brave face and attempted to treat me as if I was almost human, stepping over to ask me asinine, insulting questions as if I was a curiosity they could poke at, but not quite human. Closeted gay men came on to me in droves, in private, of course. Some were hateful. Some were instantly attracted to me. You know, it takes all kinds, and the mainstream culture at the time was preoccupied with tokens of what was then referred to as sexual ambiguity, like Boy George and Michael Jackson or Pete Burns from Dead or Alive. They were easy to discuss and easy to dismiss. The Jekyll and Hyde personalities of closeted guys who were engaged, married, or dating women was striking. So hard to keep up that facade and to stick to all of those lies. And very many different people told me how many types of gays there were, 
with a never-ending list of stereotypes they had in their minds. And those were the Allies. It just went on and on. And they told me about their gay cousins. I never knew how many people had so many gay cousins until I came out at work. I worked as a temp in one international bank with some very pleasant people who were all smart and cool, and a gay man and lesbian who were extremely successful and extremely elitist. They contributed to the community by writing checks at events, but were not public. No warm and fuzzies. I, of course, worked in restaurants. I did everything. I worked for one chef, and at the time, I was a bit on the larger, muscly side. I was a bit pumped, or jacked, as they say, and had my trademark short hair, and looked a bit more regimented than a lot of the others I worked with. That was then. The chef asked me point-blank, in his French accent, why I always look like the enemy. And he was an ally. My answer, A because it's a little hot, and B, because it's a little subversive. I will proudly proclaim that my knowledge of wine is closer to Pawn Stars versus Antiques Roadshow. That's my analogy, and most people get it. But I still only know what I like, and I learned how much I didn't know when I was e-commerce manager for America's premier wine merchant. One of the guys I work with had a Ph.D. in philosophy and knew everything about wine. He was a world-class expert on Burgundy. So Bordeaux, the place I work for specialized in Bordeaux, was a snap to him. He gave me a few crash courses out of the spirit of generosity, and I am forever grateful. Just like when I went to the French Culinary Institute and was mentored by a friend who happened to be a master chef, who I had known and worked with years beforehand, and he mentored me right through graduation. He also introduced me to and had me apprentice, or commis, under one of the world's greatest chefs, who was an extremely gracious, courtly, kind gentleman and a great teacher. If you have ever watched the TV series Mad Men, their go-to restaurant was his restaurant. I thought I knew how to cook until I went there and learned how much I didn't know. But I became a legitimate chef, had a reputation for being good, mostly a saucier roundsman, so I thought. I worked the line, but I kept on getting gigs as a pastry chef, no matter what my skill set was directed at. So they needed pastry chefs who notoriously create dessert menus, then abruptly quit. Though it wasn't like they only wanted gay men, but I did get a few good gigs doing pastry while I was more personally focused on being a saucier. I had my mind set on it for some reason, but I had to be flexible. What can I tell you? But really, six and one, half a dozen of the other. It's the skills, and you acquire more and more along the way. Working in the food service industry is hard enough in the first place. Being in close proximity to primitive-minded hostiles with knives and blunt instruments was not reassuring, and the rampant homophobia was hardly tempered by the several decent bosses I had in and out of the kitchen, and the public treated servers horribly, folks. We still do. I'd like to say it is ancient history, but I just can't. We have a very long way to go. If anyone is a foodie, they might have followed the lurid stories of sexual harassment and abuse which have made the news for the last few years. It is a very common experience. So I bounced around and eventually got a job in media. And because I had been tempered by several decades of stress and abuse, <laughs> I was much more comfortable in my skin than many of my colleagues in media in New York City. And because of that, I became a touch point for a number of people who confided in me and then became confident in coming out and work. So I take great pride in that as well. It wasn't easy, but I had to be myself. I gotta be me. 
Also, I was either unaware of resources or they were not accessible to me in most instances. So I plugged away and fumbled and stumbled, not like now, <laughs> around and hit a few snags. And even when I became the touch point, I had to endure the elitism and classicism of others who were farther along in their careers and political connections and held higher positions of authority. Personally, I have been gay bashed twice and still feel the crippling, withering, mind numbing, painful consequences every second of every day. So it hardly matters to me. It's not like I'm going to host a super private elite party in the Pines or the Hamptons. I am an old war horse, hardly a stallion. I do not put too much stock in happy talk especially when people are mining the same vein or milking the same sentiment or telling the same story to arouse an emotional response to their former plight or trauma for literally decades. Play another record, as they say. Give it a rest, as I like to say. Empathize. Don't try to rope other people into a corner. It's cloying and sticky. We get it. Just be on the level and stop the arrested development thing. People might often wonder why you are so stuck on it, and then just might think that you exploit terrible events in current events to remain stubbornly attached to those time-worn tales. Nah. Everybody has a story to tell, but they all don't get a platform to tell and hone the same few stories over and over and over so much that they have it all on autopilot and again and again to evoke an emotional response which seems to benefit them more than the cause of equality and liberation and was used to their advantage and advanced their ambitions. Sort of like in the movie version of Auntie Mame, when Patrick Dennis's fiance Gloria Upson tells the story of stepping on the ping pong ball. Oh, really? It kind of loses its punch after repeated telling. No more warm and fuzzies. More like industrial grade tear jerking. The rest of us just have to keep on living. And I sincerely hope we all remember that it is still quite the struggle and not everyone is comfortable in their own skins and a lot have their own issues and just cannot discuss openly who they are and we need to keep that in mind. Not just have blanket opinions of others who need to find their own inner strength. I've been there and I know what they're going through. Live and let live, everybody. Thanks for listening. See you next time. And as the kitties say, peace out.